Good morning. Welcome to A2. Would you stand with us? Put your hands together. We're going to sing.
Jesus, 
Amen. Let's give Jesus a big shout of praise. Come on. Amen. He's so good. Amen. It's great to see you. I'm going to ask you to be seated. Thank you. Good morning, A2 Church. Okay, um, we're going to try it again because it's Christmas, y'all. All right, it's the spirit of giving. There's twinkle lights everywhere. It's a good time, so let's try it again. Good morning, A2 Church. There it is. Uh, some of you may know me, some of you might not. My name's Tiffany. And some of you may know and some of you may not that in my house, during the month of November, it's a battleground because it's Thanksgiving versus Christmas. Some people care about Thanksgiving. They love the food, turkeys, whatever. Um, and their position is, you can't start Christmas until after Thanksgiving. Okay, it's a valid opinion if you wanna have it. But other people <laughs> don't give a darn about turkey and want to put up twinkle lights on November 1st. But it's okay now, because it's December. It's all a moot point, and it's Christmas, y'all. Amen. That's right. If you're a first, second, or third time guest here, I want you to know not everybody is crazy, it's just me, but we welcome you, or welcome back. Um, the only thing we ask of you this morning is that you grab one of those connection cards in the seat in front of you, fill that out. We want to know you're here. We want to know about your experience. And for guests and regulars, if there's anything we can join with you in prayer about, let us know on the back side of that card. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We want to partner with you in that way. So please give us that opportunity. If you call A2 Church home, now is the time to prepare to honor God with his tithe our offering. If you are a guest, we don't want you to feel obligated to give, but if you call A2 Church home, now is the time we invite you to give and give joyfully. When you came in, you should have received one of those programs that says Christmas Upside Down. Make sure you check that out. It is jam-packed full of all kinds of great information about what's going on here at A2 and what we've got for you, but I want to highlight three things really quickly. The first thing is A2's No Limit Christmas. It's happening next Sunday, and we are so excited about it. There's only about 15 more children who need to be sponsored for an amazing, joyous Christmas morning. If you are interested in doing that, right after service, go out to the No Limits Christmas table, get the name of a child from right here in Birmingham and their gift list. We will need those gifts just as soon as possible because next Sunday, December 14th, right here in this room at 4 p.m., we will have the No Limits Christmas Banquet where we'll be serving all of our No Limit families um, with food and fellowship and lavishing on them the love of Jesus. If you want to help us out with that, you can sign up at the No Limits table or just let us know on the back of your connection card. Second, I want to talk about Christmas here at A2. The next couple of weeks are going to be amazing. Um, next Sunday, the 14th, we've got our Christmas celebration. And then the Sunday after that, we've got our down home Christmas. And it doesn't matter to me which is which as long as it's Christmas. I'm excited about it. You don't want to hear about it secondhand. Be here. Mark your calendar, set the alarm, just get here. All right. And then there is the Christmas Eve service. I don't know about you guys, but I look forward to it every single year because Christmas is hectic. Christmas is crazy. I mean, it's magical and it's pretty, but you can really get wrapped up in the shopping and the food and the family and the travel. And on Wednesday, December 24th, in this room at 5.30 p.m., you have the chance to come and refocus on what Christmas is truly about, which is Jesus. It's a great time. You do not want to miss it. You definitely want to be here if you can, okay? Uh, and as our ushers prepare to serve us, we're going to prepare our hearts. Can we do this? We're going to prepare our hearts to light 
the Advent wreath right now. Um, Advent comes from a Latin word meaning coming or arrival. Uh, it's all about the coming of Jesus, his first coming as a tiny infant in a barn, and then his next coming in the clouds, victorious as our conquering king. That's what it's about, and that's what we're remembering. Last week, we lit the first candle. Um, it's called the candle of prophecy, sometimes the candle of hope. It's to remind us that every single prophecy about the Messiah was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's to make us remember that he is our hope. Today, we've lit the candle of love, sometimes called the Bethlehem candle. And it's to remind us of God's extravagant love for us, which was demonstrated by Jesus coming as a baby in a manger for the ultimate sacrifice to sacrifice himself for us, for our sins, and in our place. That's what we're remembering during this season. The ushers are gonna come uh, right after I pray. It's your chance to turn in those connection cards or to partner with us in ministry by offering God his tithe and our offering. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your extravagant love. Thank you for sending your son to live as one of us and to sacrifice himself for all of us. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to remember that and to celebrate that this entire season. Touch our hearts, Lord, and remind us while we're running around doing all of our Christmas traditions what this is really about. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
focus for, for a moment on the extravagant love of God that we just sang about. What Christ accomplished for us. And there's a passage in the Psalms that says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he has redeemed from the clutch, from the hand of the enemy. And there is another passage that says, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with triumphant praise. If you're thankful for God's extravagant love revealed in Jesus, for what Jesus Christ has done for you, I'd like for us to give God a loud clap offering of our praise. Let's just let it ring. Come on, let it ring. Let it ring. Jesus, you're so good, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, welcome to A2 Church and to the second week in our series, Upside Down Christmas. This morning is called Upside Down God, and hopefully it will become rather clear as to why we're calling it that. Uh, if you've got your Bible, open your Bible to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. We looked at the first portion of Matthew 1 last week. Today we're going to start at verse number 18. If you brought your Bible, open it. If not, it'll come up on the screen. And it begins like this, Matthew 1, verse number 18. Now let's just take the screen dart. There we go. Matthew 1, 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man. And he did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. <laughs> 
As he considered this, while he thought about this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son. Uh, this passage, when we read it, we should never read it uh, casually, because this is rather amazing. She will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. Yeshua. God saves, for he will save his people from their sin. Verse 22. And all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Uh, this was a 700-year-old prophecy given by Isaiah. It's recorded in what we would call Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. And this is the prophecy that the birth of Jesus Christ fulfilled. Let's say it out loud because we'll spend the rest of our time on this single verse. So let's all say it together, beginning at verse 23. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. We'll spend all of our time on verse 23. Verse 23 is actually a quotation of Isaiah 7, 14, and I want us to say it one more time out loud and together. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. Would you just say that name out loud again? Emmanuel. Say it again. Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, this morning we're going to focus on one Hebrew word, Emmanuel. According to which English translation you're using, it gets translated as three or four English words. God is with us. Emmanuel. God is with us. We'll just hang out on that single word for the entire message. And some of you are wondering, wow, all of that time on this single word. There are people in the world who have spent all of their life on that single word. Uh, we're a non-denominational church, but some of you have a background in Methodism. If you do, you might be familiar with a guy named John Wesley. Anybody heard of John Wesley? He's actually the founder of the Methodist church. Uh, John Wesley was an amazing man. One of his biographers indicates that during his life, Wesley usually traveled on horseback. And he preached two or three times a day. He died when he was 88 years of age. And over the course of his life, he rode over 250,000 miles. Did you get that? 250,000 miles on horseback. He preached more than 40,000 sermons. When he died at the age of 88, his family and friends gathered with him in a small room. And Wesley would talk to them occasionally, and he became rather frustrated by the fact that they couldn't understand most of what he was saying. But he grew closer and closer and closer to death, so he mustered all of the strength he could muster. And these were the last words John Wesley ever said. It'll come up on the screen. The best of all is God is with us. His biographer writes, by the way, his daughter wrote one of his biographers, that after he said that once, he mustered all of the strength he could to raise his hand towards God. And he said once more, clearly so that they could understand, the best of all is God is with us. And then he died. Those were the last words he ever spoke. And, and here's my challenge today. Just as Wesley died with those words on his lips, my challenge is going to be that we would live with those words on our heart. Because if we begin to live out those words, those words change everything. I mean, what would happen in your life if we began to take the message of Christmas seriously? How would your life change if you began to really believe that regardless of where you are at home, in your office, on the job site, 
in the shopping mall, that God is with us, that God is with you, it would radically change everything. In fact, out of that one Hebrew word, four English words are three upside down truths. Here they are, truth number one, reality number one, Jesus is God. God is with us, Jesus is God. See, the simple meaning of Christmas is that the creator, the same God who spoke the universe into existence, the same God who rules time and space, the same king of all the universe became a human being. That's the essence of what Christmas is all about. Everything else is secondary. Peace on earth, goodwill to men, love for mankind, all of that flows out of this idea that the pre-existent eternal son of God became a human being. And Matthew doesn't waste any time. In his biography, right up front, he gets to the point, he confronts us with the reality of who Jesus is. In fact, for the rest of his biography and for the rest of the New Testament, the writers are going to confirm either directly or indirectly the same thing that Jesus is God. And guys and gals, the incarnation... The idea that Jesus Christ is completely God, 100% God, and completely man, 100% man, is one of the most extraordinary, if not the most extraordinary miracle in all the Bible. If it is true, everything in this book makes sense. If it is not true, nothing in this book makes sense. In fact, anybody here heard of legendary talk show host named Larry King? Anybody heard of Larry King? Larry King was once being interviewed, and the interviewer asked him, if you could interview anybody from all of history, who would you interview? King did not hesitate. He said, Jesus Christ. The interviewer responded, what question would you ask him? Once again, King did not hesitate. King said, I'd like to ask him if he was indeed virgin-born, because the answer to that question would define history for me. Wow. King was right. Guys and gals, if the incarnation is true, if the virgin birth is true, if God in Jesus Christ really took upon himself flesh, everything in this book makes sense. And again and again throughout this book, the Bible screams, the Bible shouts, over and over, Jesus is God. Maybe you're asking, where does the Bible say things like Jesus is God? Well, right here, Matthew 1, which is simply a quotation of a 700-year-old prophecy from Isaiah 7, 14. You'll call his name Emmanuel, God with us. How about this one? John 1, verse number 1 and verse number 14. Anybody remember this? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word took upon himself flesh and came to live among us. Paul was crystal clear on this. Paul was speaking to the elders of the church at Ephesus. In writing to the elders of the church at Ephesus, Paul said, hey, whatever you do, be careful to feed, shepherd the flock of God, God's church, which he purchased with his blood. According to Paul, the blood of Jesus was the blood of God. Now, the Bible says this directly, but the Bible also illustrates this throughout. For instance, all kinds of things Jesus did throughout his lifetime demonstrated the fact that he was and is God. For instance, several things will come up on the screen. You might want to write them down on that blank sheet of notes that you have. Uh, evidences of Jesus' deity, Jesus' power over disease. Uh, this week, I spent some time just going through the Gospels, highlighting the miraculous healings of Jesus. And guys, I want to tell you, my faith began to soar. There are 40 miracles recorded in the Gospels. There are 23 distinct physical and mental healings mentioned in the Gospels. And according to the closing words of John's, Gospels, uh, John's Gospel, these don't even scratch the surface as to the miracles Jesus did. For instance, Jesus healed the son of a government official who was at the point of death, and he did it just by speaking the word. On several occasions, Jesus healed people from demonic oppression and possession. Jesus, every time I read this story, I smile a little bit. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law 
a miracle Peter might not have asked for. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law who was sick in bed, suffering from a high fever. Jesus healed people who were suffering from leprosy, and that was completely unheard of in the first century. Jesus healed the servant of a Roman centurion who was paralyzed and in excruciating pain. And once again, he did it just by speaking his word. Jesus healed a man who was paralyzed and brought to him by a group of four friends. Jesus healed a guy with a deformed hand, a withered hand. Jesus healed a woman who had been hemorrhaging blood for more than 12 years. Jesus regularly restored the sight of the blind. Jesus healed a guy who was an invalid, a paraplegic. He had been that way for 38 years, and Jesus healed the guy just by speaking his word. Jesus said, stand up, get up, take up your mat, mat and start walking, and the guy started walking. We're talking miraculous power. Jesus healed a guy who was deaf. A guy who had a speech impediment. And you're going to love the way he healed this guy. And, and if, we, if we began to enact this at A2 Church, it would be a great way to reduce our crowds and a great way to make certain nobody came forward because Jesus healed this guy by placing his fingers in the guy's ears and then spitting on his hand and touching the guy's tongue. Say, why? I don't know why. But when the guy walked away healed, I can guarantee you this. He wasn't asking why. He was just saying, wow, 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 I've been healed by the power of God. Jesus healed a woman who was so twisted and bent by arthritis that she couldn't even look up. In fact, one translation says she was doubled over. Jesus healed a man whose joints were severely swollen. Jesus even, this blows my mind, he even restored the severed, amputated ear of one of the guys who came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. The ministry of Jesus was a healing ministry. In fact, you realize this, there are a couple of occasions in the New Testament when they can't tell us about individual miracles, so they just have to summarize what transpired. For instance, Matthew chapter 4, it reads like this. People soon began bringing to him all who were sick, and whatever their sickness or disease, if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. And that kind of sentence doesn't just appear once. It appears again another occasion. Luke chapter 4, it reads like this. As the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand. I love that. The touch of his hand. The touch of his hand healed everyone. Jesus' power over disease demonstrates his divinity. See, the miracles of Jesus were not just a demonstration of power. They weren't a part of Jesus' PR strategy, his social media strategy to build a huge crowd. According to the writers of the Gospels, according to Jesus himself, they were a demonstration of Jesus' deity. They were a demonstration that the same omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God who spoke the entire world into existence had showed up on this planet in flesh and blood and he had come to begin to restore this fallen planet back to himself. Jesus' power over disease demonstrates his divinity. Second thing that demonstrates his divinity, his power over nature. I mean, Matthew chapter 8, the disciples are in a boat. Jesus is asleep, and there arises this fierce storm, and the disciples awaken Jesus, afraid that they're going to lose their lives. Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Jesus got up, looked at this group of guys as if to say, really, really, why are you afraid? You have such little faith. Then he spoke to the winds. He spoke to the waves, and the waves Calm down, the wind ceased to blow. And the Bible says the response of the disciples was that they were terrified and they were amazed. They said, who is this man? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Or how about this occasion? Anybody remember another occasion when Jesus came walking to the disciples on the water? Have you ever asked yourself, why did Jesus walk on water? I mean, why? 
Was Jesus a show off? Because let's just be gut level honest. If I could walk on water, if I could walk on water, I would make an announcement this morning during this service. In fact, we would have the television cameras here. We'd make an announcement. I'd ask you to meet me at Oak Mountain State Park immediately following this experience. And we would have a walking on water ceremony. Was Jesus a show off? Absolutely not. And by the way, don't look at me so pious. You would do that too. I know you well enough to know you would. Was Jesus a show off? Absolutely not. There's a great verse in the Old Testament that gives us insight as to why Jesus walked on water. Job 9 verse 8 it reads like this. He, in other words, God, God alone has spread out the heavens. And God alone marches on the ways of the sea. That verse was common knowledge to Jesus' disciples. That verse was common knowledge to Jews in the first century. They were familiar with the thought that God alone marches on the waves of the sea. And when Jesus chose to walk on water, he wasn't simply demonstrating his power. He was demonstrating his divinity. This wasn't a carnival show. It was an object lesson for his disciples. Jesus was letting his disciples know, I'm the same God who created it all. And I'm the same God who can command and control it all. Jesus' power over nature demonstrates his divinity. Third, Jesus ability to forgive sin. You ever wondered why on some occasions, even when Jesus was healing people, instead of saying, you're healed, he would say, your sins are forgiven. And on one occasion, he even said, which is, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or you're healed, but that you may know the Son of Man has power. I'll say this. See, Sin is the human problem. All sin is ultimately committed against God. And because of that, God alone has the power to forgive sin. Jesus could only forgive sin because he was and is God. Fourth piece of evidence, Jesus' power and authority over death. I mean, it's one of the greatest pieces of evidence. He shows up at the funeral procession of a young man interrupts the funeral procession by placing his hand on the casket. At that point, he had immediately become ceremonially unclean. He goes even further. He touches the young man and says, get up. And the guy walks away from his own funeral ceremony. Jesus raises the 12-year-old dead daughter of Jairus. Jesus Christ raises his friend Lazarus from the dead who had been dead for four days. But the greatest feat in all of history was this. Jesus prophesied his death and his burial. And three days after being placed in a tomb, Jesus Christ vacated the tomb victorious over death and the hell. And that authenticated the fact that he was and is God. Fifth piece of evidence. Jesus allowed himself to be worshipped. This is pretty amazing. There are several occasions in the Bible where an angel would show up to make an announcement to someone and the tendency, the response of most people upon the visitation by a supernatural being like an angel would be to bow in worship. And do you remember on each occasion how an angel would respond? The angel would say, whoa, 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 cool your jets. Get up, don't worship me. I'm a created being just like you, but Jesus. There are a few occasions in the New Testament when people were so overwhelmed by the presence of Jesus, by the grace of Jesus, that all they could do was to fall prostrate, get prone, and worship Jesus. And Jesus not only forbade that, but he actually allowed it and even on occasion commended it. Now, first century Jews are among some of the least likely people in all of history to come to the conclusion that Jesus is God. But many people came to that conclusion. Uh, think of it this way. If I wanted to convince somebody that I was God, if I wanted to start a cult and convince somebody that I was God, I can tell you a group I would not start with. I would not start with my family. <laughs> I mean, my brothers wouldn't buy it. My wife wouldn't buy it. My wife would stand up and say, you might be the devil, but you sure as heck aren't God. 
And I can guarantee you this, that people who worship Elvis, you know, people who worship Elvis, people who make the pilgrimage to Graceland and throw those flowers on the grave every year, Kevin Johnson, people who worship Elvis, never lived with Elvis. But get this, people who grew up with, people who lived with Jesus, came to the conclusion that the only answer that can possibly match everything we've witnessed, everything we've seen, is the fact that Jesus is God. There's a theologian by the name of John Frame. He says this alone is astonishing. In fact, Frame writes this, it will not come up on the screen, Frame writes, during the next three years or so, all these Jewish disciples and many more besides are convinced that Jesus is God and deserves to be worshiped as God. They have known him intimately as a man, have walked and talked and eaten with him, yet they've come to worship him. And John Frame says, that is astonishing. I'll go back to this, guys. If Christmas actually happened, if Jesus was and is actually God in the flesh, everything about Christianity makes sense. Everything. And if Christmas never happened, nothing makes sense. We can close shop and go home. But the first, first upside down reality from Matthew 1, 23 is this, Jesus is God. Here's the second upside down reality. Jesus is God with. Jesus is God with us. God, same God who created it all, actually became a man. I want you to fathom that. Fathom for a moment the humility of God. Think about it this way. Up until this moment, up until the moment Jesus walked on the scene, does anybody remember what it was like whenever God would show up and show out? What was the ordinary common response of people? They were terrified. Terrified. God reveals himself to Job in the form of a whirlwind or tornado, and Job can't look up. Job repents. God reveals himself to Abraham in a terrifying darkness. And all of a sudden, Abraham sees a blazing fire pot and a flaming torch somehow passing between the carcasses of animals he has sacrificed to God. And the response, Abraham was terrified. God reveals himself to Moses in the form of a burning bush. And Moses has to take off his shoes. God reveals himself to the children of Israel in a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. And the response was always overwhelming whenever the glory of God would descend. Anybody remember the response of the children of Israel when they approached Sinai? It appears in Exodus 20. It'll come up on the screen. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain. They stood at a distance trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen. But don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. See, up until that moment, up until the moment Jesus arrived on the scene, getting in the presence of God was absolutely terrifying. A whirlwind, a violent storm, a burning fire pot, a flaming torch, flashes of lightning, peals of thunder. This is why people would usually go face first when the presence of God arrived. But when God revealed himself to Jesus, does anybody remember how he showed up? I think we're going to have to have some help up here with this mic. Let's change it out, Ben. I need another mic. What do I need to grab? because I can't, uh, I can't handle that distraction the whole time. Is this cool? Is that cool? How about that? Is that okay, guys? Let's try that. When God revealed himself to Jesus, anybody remember how he showed up? As a baby. Luke 2, verse number 12, look at it. This is how you'll recognize him. You will find a baby lying in a manger, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. And for the first time in history, God was 
approachable. For the first time in history, God was accessible. I want you to think for a moment about the humanity of Jesus. What a miracle that was. According to Luke 2, 52, Jesus experienced all the normal stages of childhood development. He grew as a boy. Imagine that he experienced the insanity of puberty. He grew to be a man. And as he grew, he didn't live in luxury. He worked as a carpenter until he was 30 years old. As a man, Jesus got hungry just like you get hungry and he needed to eat. As a man, Jesus got thirsty just like you get thirsty and he needed to drink. Jesus got tired like we get tired and he needed to rest. Jesus, have you ever thought about his emotional life? He experienced emotions like sadness, anger, disappointment. Jesus wept at the funeral of a friend. And by the way, when Jesus was arrested, interrogated, tortured, the crown of thorns they placed upon his head drew real blood. The nails that went into his hands and feet pierced real flesh, caused real pain. And finally, Jesus died a real death. And you know why the humanity of Jesus is essential? See, the first point is Jesus is God. Second point is Jesus is God with. You know why the humanity of Jesus is essential? Because of the mission he came to accomplish. Jesus came to represent the human race before God. And part of, part of his work on earth was to be our priest. And in the Old Testament, a priest's role was to stand before God on behalf of the people. This is exactly why Hebrews 2.17 says it was necessary. It was necessary that Jesus came to be our priest and representative before God. It was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters. So that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. In other words, with Jesus, God didn't come in a tornado. God didn't come in fire. God didn't come in peals of thunder. He came in flesh. He came as God with us. This is why great writers like Philip Yancey, they describe it like this. Philip Yancey writes, the God who came to earth came not in a raging whirlwind, nor in a devouring fire. Unimaginably, the maker of all things shrank down, 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 so small as to become an ovum, a single fertilized egg, barely visible to the naked eye, an egg that would divide and redivide until a fetus took shape, enlarging cell by cell inside a nervous teenager. God who roared, who could order armies and empires about like pawns on a chessboard, this God emerged in Palestine as a baby who could not speak or eat solid food or control his bladder, who depended on a teenage couple for shelter, food, and love. The second upside down reality is Jesus is God with. That's why Barbara Bound Taylor, she summarized that word Emmanuel like this. She said, his name is Emmanuel, the God who is with us, who is made out of the same stuff we are and who is made out of the same stuff God is and who will not let either go. See, the fact that Jesus is God with made it possible for him to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sin in our place. And furthermore, the fact that Jesus is God with means that he knows what we're going through. Have you experienced pain? He experienced it. You ever felt isolated, lonely? Jesus experienced it. Have you ever been betrayed by a friend? Jesus experienced it. He knows. The fact that Jesus is God with means that he knows. He knows. Here's the third upside down reality. Jesus is God with, everybody say this two-letter word out loud and together, us. Come on, say it again. You're being somewhat reticent this morning. Say it again, us. Here's my question. Who's us? Who is us? Check out the guest list for the first Christmas. 
The guest list for, for the first Christmas didn't include a single religious leader. Maybe that's an indication of, of the importance Jesus placed on religion. Guest list for the first Christmas didn't include a single political leader. Maybe that's an indication of the priority Jesus places on politics. It didn't include a single celebrity. Maybe that's an indication of the importance, the value Jesus places on celebrity. First people to meet, greet Jesus were a group of common, ordinary shepherds. And when the shepherds showed up at the barn, they didn't bring a big increase of class to the affair. I mean, these guys didn't buy their clothes at Saks or Banana Republic. They weren't especially known for their hygiene. And by the way, a lot of depictions of these shepherds make them appear to be older men. But most scholars say these shepherds were likely in their teens, 15 to 16-year-old guys. But they're tops on the guest list to greet Jesus. 18 months later, a group of wise men, magi from the east, show up to visit Jesus. They present him gifts of gold, frankincense, myrrh. And if the shepherds represent the down and out, the magi represent the up and out. These guys were wealthy. These guys were respected. But get this, these guys were thoroughly confused. I mean, according to one scholar, their religion was at its heart satanic, based in superstition and fear, not on the truth of God. But regardless of the spiritual confusion they lived in, God commandeered a star to bring them face to face with Jesus. And I've got news for you. I don't know how you got here or what you think about Jesus. God may not have commandeered a star to get you here, but he did commandeer a Ford. He did commandeer a Nissan. He did commandeer a Toyota to bring you right to this moment so you can know that Jesus is God with us. What's the message from the guest list? Shepherds and magi. The message is Jesus came for everyone. He came for the poorest of the poor. He came for the richest of the rich. He came for the down and out. He came for the up and out. He came for those who couldn't care less about religion. He came for those who were thoroughly spiritually confused. He came for everyone. He came for you. Remember what the angel said. This is how you'll recognize him. You'll find him as a baby lying in a manger. Come on to the keyboard, Janet. You, in other words, the angel said, you'll, you'll recognize him. Because he'll show up in the messiest place you can imagine. A baby will be born in a barn, wrapped in rags, surrounded by animals, entrusted to the care of a couple of poverty-stricken teenagers. And why would he do that? To demonstrate the fact that there's no place he won't go. There's nothing he won't do. There are no depths to which he will not descend to reach you with his extravagant grace. Now those are the three upside down realities of Matthew 1, 23, Isaiah 7, 14. Jesus is God. Jesus is God with, Jesus is God with, with us. Now, now here's the question I ask myself every time I put together a message. It's a two word question. So So what? What does that mean to my life, Chris? Let me give you three takeaways, three applications. You ready? Here's the so what behind the message. First one is this. Take the limitations off God. Take the limitations off God. If God went to this great length to get to you, to rescue you, to redeem you, you can trust Him with whatever you're going through. Furthermore, how would your life change today if you really began to believe that Jesus is God with me? God with me in this sickness. God with me in this debt. God with me in my career. God with me in my ministry. God with me in my marriage. God with me in my relational life. How would it change? Take the limitations off God. Second application. Since Christmas is all about God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. Why am I so casual and complacent about being with God? 
See, I don't know how we read Matthew 1, 23 and just, and just remain complacent. His name is Emmanuel. God is with us. What keeps you from experiencing God's love? On a regular basis, what keeps you from spending time with God? What keeps you from being with God? Is it a habit you struggle to surrender? Is it the fact that you're just way too busy? Is it the fact that you allow worry and anxiety to regularly run roughshod over you? Is it the fact that you just won't take the time, effort, energy necessary? My thought is this, after all God went through to be with us, how can we allow trivial sideshow distractions to keep us from being with Him? He wants to be with us. In just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity to spend time with him. And this always amazes me at the end of an experience. How many, how many of us are so intent on quickly getting to the end of this? Where we're going to go for lunch, and we eat lunch every day. It's not like it's a new experience. Right? And, and come on, come on. It's not even like we enjoy the places we rush to beat everyone to. Occasionally we have a great meal and we write home about it, but most of the time it's just for sustenance. It's just I've got to eat because it's the thing I do at 12 noon. All the while there's this opportunity since God has come to be with us for us to be with God and and we take a pass. Second reality, after all God's done to be with us, why am I so casual and complacent about being with God? Here's the third reality, and the team will come on with this one. If Jesus really is God, if he really is God, then I've got to do business with that reality. Some of us are just way too casual and complacent about the meaning of Christmas. And John Stott nailed us on this in his classic, Basic Christianity. Here's what John Stott said. He wrote, if you read the Bible, you'll see that nobody who ever met Jesus ever had a moderate reaction to him. There are only three reactions to Jesus. They either hated him, wanted to kill him. They were afraid of him, wanted to run away. Or they were absolutely smitten with him and they tried to give their whole lives to him. If Jesus really is God, we've got to decide which of those three categories we're going to fit into. As for me, I want to be the guy who is smitten with him and for the rest of my life attempts to give my whole life to him more and more every day. I want to give you that invitation. I'm going to pray, and this prayer is going to include an invitation to receive Jesus Christ. If you've never surrendered to Him as God, as Lord, this is going to include that invitation. Or maybe you've been casual and complacent, and you need to re-surrender, recommit your life. It's going to include that invitation, re-surrender. Because you can't be casual. If Christmas is true, it changes everything, including your response right now. So I want to ask you to pray with me. Are you ready? Close your eyes. Pray this out loud if you're ready to surrender. Out loud, but not alone. Faith family at A2, say it with me. Let's pray out loud and together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus who came to die for my sin in my place, who is God with us. I surrender my life everything there is about me to him and I ask him to forgive my sin and lead my life amen 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 if you prayed that prayer Jesus is with you and he wants to walk alongside you and here's how we're going to end I'm going to ask Janet to go back and lead us in the song that they sang right before the message. 
I'm going to ask you to stand to sing this as a statement of faith about what Christ has accomplished. And at the end of that song, I'm going to ask our prayer teams. Prayer teams, I need the help of every prayer team in the room this morning. I'm going to ask you to come stand right here, right in the center near the front. Prayer teams, please come because I'd prefer not to come back around. Janet will just close us out. And if you need any prayer, as we close out with how marvelous and then we be, just begin to sing that portion of the song that lacks a lyric but just includes a melody and allows us to express our heart to God. If you need prayer on any issue going on in your life, this is your opportunity to come and pray with somebody. And everybody else can be dismissed. But let's sing this as a statement of faith out loud to our great God. You ready? Let's sing.
continue to pray. And you're dismissed. Pray you have an awesome day. God bless.